Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Constitutional Chats. I am Janine Turner and I am an actress known for Northern Exposure, I suppose, and other things. You can check out JanineTurner.com, which gives you all those details. But I'm also the founder and co-president of Constituting America. And uh, this is my pride and joy. And I think I've given over 500 and some odd speeches to classrooms across the world. Um, well, across the United States. I wouldn't say the world. I don't think the whole world cares about the United States Constitution. So definitely just the United States. <laughs> but it could be the world now that we're on in live Zooms. It could be the world. Okay, anyway, enough about me, as they say in Hollywood. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? Ha ha ha. Get it? That's a Hollywood joke. Okay, co host Kathy Gillespie. Kathy Gillespie is the most amazing person in the world. I'd like to say it takes a left wing and a right wing to fly. And without Kathy, I would just be flapping around on the ground just with all these ideas, just hoping, hoping I could get off the ground. And Kathy was a chief of staff on the Hill for over 20 years. So she is an administrator galore. And uh, she's also been picked as one of the 16 you know, citizens, which is a, just a coup and an absolute coup to get her, I shall say. Uh, quite a prestigious honor to be picked to be a part of the semi-quincentennial commission, semi-quincentennial commission, I can say that, semi-quincentennial commission, um, for to planning our 250th anniversary of, um, of America. So we are very excited that she's doing that and they are lucky to have her. Kathy, would you like to say hello as my Labrador says hello to you? <laughs> I'm glad to share the stage with Blanca. Um, Hi everyone, we're glad that you're here and we want to thank today's sponsor, Dwayne Horner. Dwayne is a longtime friend of Constituting America. He has contributed to so many in so many different ways to our organization uh, through advice and and through uh, just his wisdom. And we are grateful to him for sponsoring our show today. And uh, Janine, I know you want to say a few words about Dwayne as well. So thank you, Dwayne Horner, for being our sponsor today. Yes, Dwayne, thank you so much. God bless you. Dwayne is just a great friend. He was there to help me launch my radio show. He's a producer on my radio show. Um, and I did that for what, two and a half, three years, I guess, a while back. Um, and you are an absolutely dedicated patriot and you love America and you love our founding principles and America is a better place because of you. And we are better people for knowing you, that you lift us up to higher realms. And we, we love you, Dwayne. And Thank you so much for your generous contribution today and for sponsoring our show. Uh, because the Supreme, for this Article 3 is really important. We need to understand it. We need to know how to curb that legislating from the bench. So thank you, Dwayne. Um, okay, now the extraordinary Tova Kaplan. Tova Love Kaplan, she's 16 years old. You just won't believe she's 16 year old. I just, I just told her she's the most extraordinary 16 year old I've ever known. And that you will ever, well, I don't know. I can't speak for you, but for me. And she's just a dear, wonderful person and very brilliant. And we're thrilled to have her. She is the a youth advisory board. She's our national youth director at Constituting America, um, which is a pr prestigious position. And she runs our national youth advisory board and she does it with a plum, like a CEO of a top 100 company. Um, and she's also won our contest three times. In middle school, she won for best entrepreneur then and since she's been in high school she won for best psa and this year she won for best stem so look she's left brain right brain and uh, she's created an app and toba you can tell us when that app's going to be up it should be up pretty soon so she really really cares about the constitution she helps us plan these shows she thinks of her own questions she helps us produce she's running a, 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 all these other projects we have going she she has her finger in she's just our best national youth advisor ever so toba love kappa would you like to say hello 
Yes, thank you so much, Janine. Uh, I just wanted to also plug our book club. I know I mentioned it last time, but for all our new people, we are starting a book club. Uh, our selection for elementary school is Camilla Can Vote, an amazing book that Dakare is being in charge of. And then this one is Miracle at Philadelphia, which is for our middle school, high school, and adult. It's an amazing book talking about the Constitutional Convention, and it's really amazing, and you can check out our book club um, on our Facebook page. Uh, it's going to be really amazing, and we're launching this week, so please check it out, and uh, I hope you all enjoy the show. And uh, we're going to have Zooms talking about the book. And The Miracle of Philadelphia is um, talks about what happened at the Constitutional Convention, breaks it all down. It's available at Amazon, and so is Camilla Can Vote, which is written by Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn's daughter. And Tova, you know her name. Do you have her right there in the book, her daughter's name? Yeah, Mary Morgan Ketchell. That's it. Mary Morgan Ketchell. Good old Southern name. Mary Morgan. <laughs> all right. Uh, Tova, I mean, thank you, Tova. And Dakari Chapman is is on a set right now. So when he joins us, we'll do a quick introduction, but he is also one of our, our co-hosts. Okay, are you ready? Drum roll, please, back by popular demand. Professor Nipreth. Uh, Professor Nipreth is a good friend of Constituting America. This is the second time he'd been on the, see, he's suave and debonair. Brilliant too, we're so lucky. Uh, it's the second time he's been a, as a guest for Constitutional Chats, but he's no stranger to Constituting America because he is a Constituting America Fellow and has written over 120 essays for our Constituting America 90 Day Studies. Um, Professor Nipreth is an expert on constitutional law and a member of Southwestern Law School faculty. Professor Nipreth has been interviewed by print and broadcast media on a number of related topics ranging from recent US Supreme Court decisions to presidential succession. He has written opinion pieces and articles on business and securities law, that sounds way over my head, as well as constitutional issues, and has focused his more recent research on the effect of judicial review on the evolution of constitutional law. So let's repeat that. His most recent research has been on the effect of judicial review, which was started by um, John Marshall uh, back in Thomas Jefferson's day, Judicial Review on the Evolution of Constitutional Law. I really think this is what we will be focusing on today, probably, as well as just breaking down Article 3, how that judicial review has affected our constitutional law. Professor Nippers, say hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for having me on once again. Uh, I, I always enjoy coming to these. Great. Okay, so we are talking about Article 3, breaking down the Constitution. So we're going to let you educate us about Article 3, and then we will we'll be a little bit like the view here and just ask you questions. Okay, so uh, thankfully, Article 3 is very brief, so that uh, will allow me as a law professor not to run on too long. Uh, so Article 3 is about the judicial branch, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and uh, there basically are three parts to that Article 3. Uh, the first one uh, sets up the uh, federal court system, uh, but note that the only court that is required under the Constitution is the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Congress has the discretion to establish inferior courts uh, under Article 3, Section 1, and it of course has done so, <clears throat> but there's a reason why uh, there was no guarantee of lower federal courts initially. Uh, Article 3, the first section, uh, also talks about something called the judicial power of the United States, which is vested in that Supreme Court and inferior courts. Uh, what does it mean to have the judicial power? That is a concept that the framers understood to mean something. Does that include the power of judicial review, as you mentioned? Uh, the second section of Article 3 uh, defines the uh, two things. The, first of all, the universe of potential federal jurisdiction, whether it's exercised by the state courts or by the federal courts. Uh, the, the federal courts or federal jurisdiction, uh, the reach of federal jurisdiction uh, is defined and limited. Uh, those are not uh, courts of general jurisdiction as the state courts might be. Uh, so Article 3, Section 2, first, defines the potential, potential universe of federal jurisdiction. And then it proceeds beyond that 
uh, to further define Supreme Court original and appellate jurisdiction. Most people don't know this, don't realize this, but there are circumstances where under the Constitution and federal statutes, the Supreme Court sits as a trial court. Uh, we normally think of the Supreme Court as an appellate court, and the vast majority of its business is just that. Uh, but there are scenarios. So for example, uh, take one case, a water law dispute among a number of the southwestern states over the Colorado River water. Uh, this was tried in the Supreme Court. Uh, and finally, uh, the third article, or third section of Article 3, deals with a peculiar issue in American history, uh, and that is treason. It uh, defines treason as a crime. It's the only crime that's defined in the Constitution. Uh, and second, it limits the potential punishment for treason. Those two clauses uh, arose out of historical practice that the English courts had engaged in, English prosecutors had engaged in, that was seen as particularly troubling uh, to the Americans. Broad, flexible definition of treason, the kind of a tainter of blood, as it was called, that could be the punishment for treason. So Article 3, Section 3 limits both the uh, substantive crime of treason and the punishment that can be imposed. OK, and so that's it, right? That's, that's uh, the overview of Article 3, and we can further flesh overview this out with questions. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye, everybody. <laughs> it's been a great show. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. Um, okay, so let's do flesh this out. The very interesting that the Supreme Court was actually, they actually had a trial in the Supreme Court, initial trials, what I'm gathering that you're saying, not as a, you know, not tears, tears, and tears later. Um, over the waterways of Colorado. What year was that? Uh, I don't don't remember. I, I it, it's you know 20, 30 years ago. It's 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 been a while. Recent. But yes, uh, what happens though in those kinds of cases is the Supreme Court doesn't have time to sit there through this massive, uh, uh, difficult water litigation or other suits like that. What they typically do is they assign a fact finding role to a magistrate that they appoint. Uh, and that person will sit there and gather the evidence and then will summarize that evidence and uh, present it uh, to the court, to the justices, and then the justices convene a trial court and the trial is much more perfunctory uh, at that point. Uh, you know, they, they can ask questions of counsel and ask witnesses, but they don't sit there through, you know, a years long trial. I thought that would have been back in the 1700s, you know, it, 1800s. I wouldn't have thought it would have been recent. So why was that one done in, yes? Uh, it was oh. in 1976. I looked it up for you. Oh, she looked it up. 19, <laughs> wow. Now see, that's really an interesting nugget, Professor Nipperth. Why? Why was it done? Why was that subject, leave it to you to bring something really unique and interesting to this, 1976. Why was it done that way? Why that subject? Why at that time? Why as... Oh. You know. Okay, if you, if you take a look at Article 3, Section 2, as I mentioned, uh, the second part of that uh, defines the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. It's what's called original jurisdiction, which is trial jurisdiction, uh, and then uh, appellate jurisdiction. The trial jurisdiction of the Supreme Court only comes up, potentially, in cases where a state is a party or where we're dealing with foreign, typically foreign ambassadors. Um, so, as, uh, but not every case where a state is a party is automatically brought in the Supreme Court. Uh, Congress has said that if a state is a party, and let's say it's between a state and an individual, uh, the, Cong the, the court can say, we're not going to hear that case, take it to the lower court first. But when you have a dispute among several states, which lower court would you send it to? Would you send it to the district court in California? Would you send it to the district court in Arizona? Would you send it to the district court in Colorado? Where do you send this? So since there's not really a forum to send it to, uh, the Supreme Court will sit as a trial court when you have a dispute involving two or more states. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, muted, I never know. Okay, that, there you go. That's really interesting. So state versus state, which I think, right. yeah, that's, 
probably pretty much wasn't that really the initial um plan of the founders it was not supposed to take on things like abortion and you know what wasn't it supposed to just be really state versus state and commerce and things of that nature or i mean i don't really know i'm just asking you but it seems like that was more the initial well, we intent have to, we have to distinguish between the jurisdiction of of, of federal interest generally speaking uh, such as disputes uh, even between citizens of different states but uh, that, that's looking at the general jurisdiction or the overall jurisdiction of any federal type court but focusing specifically on the trial jurisdiction of the supreme court that was to happen only in limited cases right where a state is a party potentially because of the dignity of the state uh, and second, where you have foreign diplomatic personnel involved, because again, the dignity of those foreign diplomatic personnel, we don't want to send that case to some trial in a state court or even in a lower federal court. Okay. Can you, I'm going to turn this over to Toba ask questions. Can, also, I think it's really cool to talk about the original circuit courts where they went around from, from state sure. to state. I'd love for you to talk about that for a second. But uh, can you give us an example of a foreign ambassador or one that's happened in regard to a foreign dignitary? I can't think of any offhand, no. Okay, that, that'd but that, be really that, that interesting. Was the, that was the thinking. What's that? That was the thinking of the framers at the time, right? You don't send a case. I, I, if, if you're gonna have a suit involving a representative of a foreign government, uh, who's, especially if someone is being sued, the dignity of this and potential international ramifications, you don't wanna send that to some, trial court, uh, many of these cases were handled by state courts, so some trial court in some county in New York. And then again, where would you send it? I mean, I know we had a few nefarious figures that came over from, I think, France and whatnot, that were trying to stir up trouble in the, right in the beginning of our, our... Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, talk about circuit courts, how they used to get on their horses, and the Supreme Court would actually go from to state to state, and then I want to turn it over to Tova. Sure, uh, I'm trying to, <laughs> this is a big topic, so I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, the uh, uh, original system, uh, the trial courts at the federal level were called circuit courts. Uh, and that's the system that basically lasted until the end of the 19th century. Uh, so that uh, the, the, the local district judge had very limited things to do, maybe admiralty cases, but the general federal trial court, to the extent federal trial courts uh, had jurisdiction, was this circuit court, which at the time, at the founding, that changed a little bit later, but at the time of the founding, the circuit court would be composed of two Supreme Court justices, riding circuit, and the local district judge. Uh, because, so it provided for a, a quorum of three to be the circuit court. But uh, because circuit riding was so arduous, one of the Supreme Court justices might be delayed. So many times the circuit court actually sitting was simply composed of the district judge, and one Supreme Court justice. What that also created uh, was a, a strange situation because the country was divided into three circuits, the uh, Northern Circuit, the, the, the Middle State Circuit, and the Southern Circuit. Uh, so you had six Supreme Court justices, all right? So that's an odd number, not, not mathematically, it's an even number, but it's an odd number for a deliberative body, uh, the potential for deadlock. So uh, that was somewhat unstable and was changed later on. Uh, but uh, the circuit writing was a very arduous matter for a lot of these justices, even ones that were appointed uh, very young. Uh, people had accidents, they suffered injuries, they, they caught uh, uh, illnesses. And uh, as the more elderly you got, uh, the more this was a problem. And the Supreme Court Justice lobbied for a long time, almost from the very beginning, relieve us of this circuit duty, writing duty. But uh, there they were. And one of the other problems, of course, is that from that circuit court, which is the general trial court, the only appeal was to the Supreme Court. There was no intermediate level of appellate courts at the time. So if you took a writ of error from the circuit court to the Supreme Court, chances were that you were challenging the decision of two of the six Supreme Court justices that had decided it below so your chances of reversal <laughs> probably aren't very good. You know? uh, you're going to have to convince all four of the other uh, justices that these uh, two uh, uh, decided incorrectly. 
So when these two were riding circuit and they made their decision, they weren't making their decision representing the Supreme Court or they, if nope. they were, it just wasn't the entire Supreme Court. Nope, they weren't, they were just circuit judges. And it was clear that they were circuit judges in that role, trial judges, not Supreme Court justices. They're arguing for the circuit court. You know, John Marshall was the uh, circuit judge in the uh, treason trial of Aaron Burr. Uh, so in 1807 or whenever that was. Uh, so, uh, you know, it never got to the Supreme Court, but he's sitting there not as Chief Justice of the United States, but as a circuit judge. See, I did not understand that at all. And now I do. So this is really interesting that when they got on their horses and went to the other areas, they were no longer there as a Supreme Court justice. They were. So is that in the Constitution that they had to go from you know, state to state and, and be a regular trial judge and not a Supreme Why would they even do that? No, there was nothing in the Constitution about that. Article 3 is fairly brief, so it doesn't say anything about that. Remember, uh, the first section says uh, there's going to be one Supreme Court and then such inferior courts as Congress chooses to, uh, to, to, to create. Congress didn't have to create any inferior courts whatsoever. Uh, in fact, it was understood that the state courts would have significant roles to play in the, uh, in the administration of federal law. Today, we have very broad what's called federal question jurisdiction in the federal courts so that federal courts can hear uh, statutory federal uh, claims involving federal statutes, treaties, uh, the Constitution. At that time, uh, based on principles of federalism in part, to draw the states into that, uh, into, into the, uh, really the administration of federal policy, and to assuage some of the concerns that the uh, people at the time had that the national government was gonna be too powerful. So you bring the states in, the state courts in as a vehicle of applying federal law to soften the impact of potential national power. Uh, moreover, uh, it's a cost saving measure. State courts are already gonna be in existence. Why should we pay for another uh, collection of federal courts? All right, that's what's going on in the minds of framers when this is written. But Congress did set up a system of federal, lower federal courts through the Judiciary Act of 1789, which is still, parts of that still remain with us today. That Judiciary Act of 1789 is an extremely important uh, uh, feature. Uh, so uh, the, the existence of courts depends not so much, other than the Supreme Court, on the Constitution as it does on action by Congress, which sets these mm -hmm. things up and controls their, the number that they, uh, of judges, uh, their, their, their jurisdiction, and so on. Okay, yeah, so that, that's really interesting. They leave, all, they leave all the district courts and everything that's been created, been created by Congress. Last sure. question, <laughs> I promise, on this. When the Fed, when, you know, John Marshall or John Jay, who was a Supreme Court, first Supreme Court, Chief Justice, that they got on their horse and went to another state to listen as just a trial lawyer, so to speak. They're still bringing the federal element to it, right? So, in other words, if the states were had their own courts, why were they? They were there because it was bringing in a federal element to the decision or the decision that the state was dealing with. Why? Well, why did they have to go there? The, well, the, this, the Congress ended up setting up federal courts in part to deal with federal type issues, but you know, um, mainly to deal with diversity disputes, uh, diversity cases. If people from different states are suing each other, you know, uh, yes, you can go to the court of one or the other of the states, but uh, that was much of the business of the early federal courts. Today, we don't think diversity jurisdiction is as important anymore. We still have that in the federal courts. Uh, but uh, uh, there's been lots of times there have been proposals to, to, to eliminate that uh, jurisdiction of the federal courts because at those, in, those, in those days, right, the idea of that you're a Virginian or that you're a North Carolinian and that sort of, sort of thing had much more hold on the people uh, than it does today. So uh, the, the concern about local prejudice against an out-of-state litigant uh, was much more pronounced at that time than it might be today. Conversely, uh, today, uh, federal courts broadly uh, exercise this federal question jurisdiction, cases involving uh, the Constitution, cases involving treaties and statutes of the United States. In those days, the concern was that we ought to let the states participate in those kinds of things, as I said, to prevent this 
to, 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 to calm people down about the concern that the new government was going to take over everything and federal government was going to destroy the, the state's uh, sovereignty. So it's kind of reversed. Uh, mm -hmm. any, by, uh, one other point about this. Generally speaking today, even as to uh, cases that involve federal statutes and so on and so forth, the state courts can still hear those cases unless Congress has made jurisdiction in the federal courts exclusive. Okay, and has done so in certain cases where the United States is a party, you can't bring the case in state court. But unless the Congress has made jurisdiction over cases exclusive in the federal courts, you can bring the dispute either in the state or the federal court, even if it involves, say, a federal statute. Okay, now this is getting a little bit deeper into federal jurisdiction. A uh, little bit But I still think it, I still I still think it's interesting that that they put them on their horses to go to have a federal oversight and, instead of just having them all just go straight on up to the Supreme Court. But I guess they had a hard time getting there, horse and buggy. Okay, Tova, go ahead. Your turn. Thank you, Professor Nippert. That was fascinating. Really, thank you. Tova, go for it. Sure. So I want to talk about treason because I think that is a very dramatic like thing to have in our Constitution. Um, so just talking about treason, um, how did they define it? Because I know today when we think of treason, I don't know, I personally think of like the 1700s, like Benedict Arnold, et cetera. Like, do, is, that a, is it a modern day thing still where people can still be um, charged with treason? What would that look like? What kind of actions would get charged as treason? And also, how do we like square charging people with treason in a country where we have complete freedom of speech freedom of assembly, freedom of petition, et cetera. Like, how do we differentiate between, like, treason and then free expression? Okay, uh, excellent point. That goes to the point of the treason definition. It was intended to be narrow. Uh, English prosecutors uh, in the 16th and 17th century, particular to, in the Tudor and Stuart, Stuart monarchies, had uh, sometimes been quite creative as to what was defined as treason. And the English common law was even worse than that because for a long period of time, the crown would have to prove its case of treason, but the defendant, the accused, was not entitled to, in, and, uh, to, to introduce evidence. Uh, so, uh, you know, that puts you behind the eight ball right there. And the punishment for treason could be exceedingly brutal. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but such things as uh, hanging or uh, execution by fire uh, were the more humane aspects of it. Uh, you get into dr what's called drawing and quartering and other such uh, uh, punishments, uh, right? Uh, plus your family uh, would be declared their blood attainted forever, meaning your property was, was forfeited to the crown. Uh, you're outside the protection of the law, you're declared into bastardry, uh, which meant something at the time, created legal disabilities. So what the framers did was they defined treason in Article 3, Section 3. And it's different from what you talked about, which potentially could be seditious speech or criminal libel, which was still punishable, of uh, the Sedition Act, for example. Uh, but treason consists, it says, only in levying war against the United States or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. So a lot of talk that one hears thrown around on various cable channels about this or that person having being, uh, being a traitor uh, doesn't meet the definition of treason. Uh, in fact, unless uh, you, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're aiding uh, uh, an enemy of the United States, a recognized enemy of the United States, it's hard to, to, to you, you can't really be accused of treason. There are other statutes that deal with passing along government secrets but that's not treason. And it provides an evidentiary standard. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. So when Bennett, not Benedict Arnold, uh, when um, uh, Aaron Burr is tried for treason in absentia, because they didn't catch him, he wasn't there, he wasn't convicted because he didn't confess in open court, he wasn't there, and they couldn't get two witnesses to the same overt act 
relating to his, you know, uh, you, you know cooperating with the enemies of the United States. Uh, they had individual witnesses to several different acts, but no two witnesses to the same overt act. So he was acquitted uh, based on that. And the punishment uh, that the article provides is Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attainted. So you don't lose your property forever. Your family is not, not, not uh, declared into, uh, into, into outlawry, basically. Uh, it only applies to the individual who actually is convicted of the treason. Have there been any modern day charges of, charges of treason? Um, and what were they for? And how did they fit in the definition? I am not aware of modern, I haven't explored this though, modern day. Uh, you know, you've had trials involving uh, treason-like activities uh, with the Rosenbergs, uh, the, the, the Russian spies. But I think that was, I don't know that that was technically a treason prosecution or some other prosecution. Uh, so I, I'm not sure, I, I just don't recall. During the uh, Civil War, uh, the Lincoln administration did proceed with sort of what's called constructive treason prosecutions, uh, which dealt with something less than formal treason, that's why they called it constructive, uh, such as sedition or uh, similar types of activity, stirring up trouble against the Union and, 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 and uh, uh, engaging in criminal libel through publishers and so on and so forth, uh, seditious libel. And then how has, like, could you go more into detail about what aiding enemies means? Because that, I know that's a narrow definition relative to what it could be, but that still seems a little bit broad to me. Like, what is defined as an enemy? Do we have to be actively at war with them? Or could we just have, like, no diplomatic relations? And what does aiding mean? It, like, it if means someone, something yeah. more. It means something more, I think, than simply uh, uh, writing an article that praises the uh, uh, greatness of uh, uh, the Red Chinese. Uh, so it's, it's not something like that. Uh, we are looking for either a formal war or something akin to that. Uh, so it would be participating on the enemy's side. If you, uh, during, during uh, World War II, uh, there were some uh, German saboteurs that were uh, caught uh, on Long Island. Uh, and one or potentially two of those had been born in the United States and then returned to Germany. So in that sense, they were American citizens, all right? So uh, this doesn't apply to a foreigner who's aiding his government against the United States, all right? Even a foreigner who's a spy here uh, would not, because it, 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 you're not committing treason against your, your country if you're not of your country. Uh, but if you're an American who's actively assisting, goes over to the other side and fights against the United States, or in some other ways adheres to their enemy, prepares the ground here for potential subversion, then you might have a case of treason. But we're not looking at the person who is, uh, su supports verbally uh, the people, uh, you know, like the Chinese government that are rivals of the United States in some ways might be considered enemies of the United States. Even during wartime, if you publish something, as I said before, as an American that, that is favorable uh, to the enemy, that's not treason. That might be criminal libel, seditious libel, but it's not treason. Hmm. Has there ever been a case where maybe a president or a court or something has abused their power and just tried to label their political enemies as treasonous? Or has the Constitution like very effectively protected against that scenario? You mean like political uh, statements? Uh, or like has <laughs> any, I don't know, has there been, ever been a case in American history where someone has tried to abuse that power of accusing people or trying people for treason or has mm -hmm. it only been in legitimate cases? 
I'm, I, I'm not aware of that in the context of actual cases. I mean, I, I mentioned the Aaron Burr prosecution, which ended up not succeeding. Uh, is that an abuse of power? Probably not, because until they get to the trial, uh, it's difficult to, uh, to establish whether or not treason is met. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, political oratory, uh, it seems to be quite commonplace today uh, to accuse uh, people of being traitors or engaging in treasonous activity. Yeah, at least you don't have to worry about being drawn and quartered, though, for that. So that is a plus. <laughs> right, our, our tarred and feathered, right? Uh, gosh, drawn and quartered was such a terrible thing. Um, okay, so Dakari is with us, and Dakari's straight off the set of Outer Banks, which I can't believe they're filming during COVID. Uh, Dakari is uh, our co-host of Constitutional Chats, and he has won our contest through two times for Best Short Film and Best PSA, and he is a great Constituting America ambassador, so devoted, just like Tova, and we're thrilled and, and uh, so lucky to have him on our team. So, Dakari, you're wearing a suit. You must have been doing something very similar on the set. Will you, will you, um, not that you don't always look dapper, but, you know, I, I don't know that I've seen a tie. Dakari, ask your questions. Yes. Um, thank you guys so much for uh, bearing with me through all this. It kind of just happened, and here I am. Um, but yes, I'm wearing this because it's kind of ironic, but the scene that we did today, I was actually in court. Um, and so <laughs> my question to Mr. Uh, to Professor Nipreth is, can you explain to me, well, I kind of have a couple questions, kind of going off of what Tova said, first of all. What is the difference between treason and espionage? Okay, uh, espionage, there, there's a statute uh, uh, enacted during World War I called the Espionage Act. Uh, there are probably other statutes that also you know, are outside of that statute, but that's one that uh, deals heavily with uh, you know, sending uh, classified information, communicating classified information. Uh, and it goes well beyond that. It has many sections uh, that reach a broad, uh, ask a broad variety of behaviors. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about that is uh, the p potential punishments for many of those sections are rather harsh. Uh, you know, in World War I, there was a case where somebody was passing out leaflets um, and his conviction of, was upheld uh, because they're supposedly inciting mutiny and interfering with the war effort, the draft, uh, and the potential punishment was 20 years in uh, federal prison. The, uh, and, and one of the controversies that, that came up not long ago uh, involving a former presidential candidate and, and uh, the, in, you know, the, the, the problem of uh, emails uh, being uh, not secured, um, uh, one of the aspects of the Espionage Act is that depending on the section that is invoked, the state of mind that's required changes. Uh, typically, the more serious a potential penalty, the more focused state of mind there has to be to engage in espionage, for example, for the purpose of uh, advancing uh, the foreign country's uh, uh, goals. Uh, whereas if the le there's a lesser punishment, then sometimes the state of mind required needn't be that focused, but merely something like recklessness. So, uh, it's a broad statute, but that gets into it. Releasing information that's classified, uh, 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 various communications, uh, uh, receiving them when it's unauthorized, those can all be covered under the Potential Espionage Act. Okay, and then my next thing is going back to set. So I was in the Court of Appeals today. So uh, can you talk about that and how it relates to uh, this, this article? The Court of Appeals, are, are you asking, I think you are, uh, about the way the structure of the federal courts yes. are basically set up? Okay. Yes. Uh, cur currently, and we've talked a little bit about the history, what it was like 200 years ago, uh, but the current structure of the federal courts is that the district court is a trial court. Uh, and uh, if, if you lose a trial there, uh, you can go to the Court of Appeals. Uh, you have an appeal to the Court of Appeals which is the circuit court. Uh, each state has at least one district court, 
Uh, other states have more than one district court. California has four separate federal districts. Uh, LA, for example, is in the central district, San Francisco, the northern district, San Diego, the southern district, and Sacramento, the eastern district. Um, uh, once you get to the circuit court, California, if I'm using the one I'm familiar with, is part of the Ninth Circuit. There are, uh, 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 there's the DC Circuit, which is primarily heavily uh, government work, and then there are 11 numbered circuits. Uh, so altogether, 12 circuits. Um, if you want to proceed beyond the circuit court, and, and circuit court panels, by the way, uh, sit in panels of three justices that are supposed to be drawn by lot as to who sits on a particular panel. Sometimes, if uh, a decision is made by a panel of the circuit court, that can be reviewed by the entire circuit court, what's called sitting on bank. Uh, that usually is not the case, however. Uh, so usually, if you want review of the circuit court decision, you have to go try to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, today, almost all Supreme Court jurisdiction is by what's called a writ of certiorari, which is a discretionary writ. The court decides what cases it wants to hear. There is very limited what's called a right of appeal. And that's been around for that that uh, been around for about uh, uh, 30, 40 years, that that uh, that restriction. Before then, most cases were still heard by certiorari, but some could be heard by appeal, where you had a right to go to the, at least theoretically, to the Supreme Court for review. All right, that's how the, the, it's, it's organized today. But most, very few cases are reviewed by the Supreme Court. Lots of oh, petitions. I just want to interrupt. Uh, uh, Dakar, you weren't here when we were talking about all this, but I just want to interject because it's interesting that it's a district court and then a circuit court. So we're back to that first circuit, we're back to the circuit court. These are the, the three, the two Supreme Court judges were on their horses. And is it the same correlation here? No, not at all. Uh, that system that we talked about when it was at the founding of the country, right? That was radically changed. There were some intermediate changes, but uh, it was radically changed at the end of the 19th century and the modern system was put in place. So today, uh, the circuit judges are their own people. Right. The district well, judges. That, that I, know. The district I, I judge, know they're not coming. I, I know they're not coming from the Supreme Court, literally, but it seems to be the same concept. Because in the end, before it changed radically at the end of the 1800s, you had the, the two Supreme Courts justices, and and then the just people in the state, kind of all the three. There were three, right? The number was three, wasn't it? And uh, now by the got time it the ended, three. actually, they were down to two. But uh, leaving it to so I, I don't want to, you know confuse people uh, here. The big difference today is that the circuit court is not a trial court as it was in those days. Oh, I see. It's oh, only okay, an appellate okay, okay, okay. court. Okay. Okay. The Supreme okay, Court, right. you know, if you want to get into the weeds about this, technically each Supreme Court justice still has supervisory role over a circuit and some have over two circuits uh, where they act as circuit justice, but they no longer go riding around. That was very interesting and also very confusing, which is why when people say I should be a lawyer, that will never happen. <laughs> but I will let Kathy answer her or ask her questions. I, Professor Nipperath, I have a question that is a lead in to one of our listener questions, and that is just on the number of Supreme Court justices. And I, I think you touched on this earlier, but um, I know currently, I guess we have nine Supreme Court justices, but I, we didn't start with nine, I don't think. Um, and how did we get to that number? How often has it changed? And then I have a follow-up question after that. All right, the number nine has pretty much been set since the roughly the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it started as six, and that was unwieldy. Uh, the Federalist Party tried to, through some machinations, tried to change it to five uh, before Jefferson came in. Uh, that didn't work. So what happens is a slight restructuring of the circuit court structure uh, in the early 1800s, and we set the number of Supreme Court justices at seven. And then it gets increased to nine, I think around 1840, somewhere around there, uh, the, the, the early 1840s maybe. Um, temporarily during the Civil War, it goes up to 10 
because of uh, just geographic issues and so on and so forth. Uh, it drops back down to nine after the Civil War, and then it stays at that level since then. Now, why nine? Because the, so you have to have a collegial body. Uh, the, this is not a, simply a trial judge as the district court judge today is. Uh, so you have to have a collegial body, which requires more than one. Two doesn't make any sense because you create deadlock. So three is, there's nothing in the constitution about this, but three is the accepted minimum number. But because of the, 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 the size of the country, the increasing number of decisions they have to write, at the time at least, justice is still riding circuit, the country getting larger and larger, it was believed that you needed to increase the size to nine, right? Now, could, we incre could Congress increase it more? Sure. People, uh, people sometimes say, well, I'm mad at the Supreme Court. I wish you know, Congress should just cut down the number of Supreme Court justices. I have a different idea. Increase the number of Supreme Court justices you know, to 35. It'll be like a faculty meeting. They'll never get anything done. <laughs> So, uh, uh, you know, there's no top end, but uh, it's, it's, it needs to be a workable group. Well, and that, that uh, goes into the second question. Dwayne Horner had wanted to hear a little bit about the court stacking effort uh, during the time of President Roosevelt. Was that, that was a situation where I think he was trying to increase the number of Supreme Court justices. Is that correct so that he could put more justices that he felt that were aligned with his political viewpoints. Um, is that the last time that there has been an effort to add numbers of justices onto the court? Uh, certainly as concerted an effort. Uh, uh, previously, actually, efforts had been to try to deny uh, a successor president the opportunity to appoint uh, 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 so to reduce the number of justices on the court. So this is the the most thorough by FDR and the last really well organized or sort of well organized attempt. The problem was that FDR uh, is making this argument, well, you got these old judges uh, on there and uh, they're, they're, they, they can't, you know, they can't keep up with their workload, but it was really a political thing. And what happens is that on the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice and uh, the most liberal uh, uh, Justice Brandeis and the most conservative Justice Vandebanner, they go to Congress and they say, we're caught up in our cases. We have no problem deciding these cases. Uh, so you had the, the, uh, the, the, the both wings of the Supreme Court objecting to Congress trying to do this. And that exposed uh, Roosevelt and his strategy so that it ended up being a Led Zeppelin, you know, dead on arrival, actually. It never went anywhere in Congress. Even the president's own uh, party turned against him on that issue. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Janine, do you want to? Yeah. Um, I, I, I know Dakari has a question. And um, oh, I quickly wanted you to clarify who gets to make the decision. I think we talked about this earlier of how many Supreme Court justices there are. Is that Congress or the president? Uh, well, Congress does that, but they're going to have to pass a statute. So uh, it, by the normal process, the president uh, gets a chance to sign or veto it. Okay, Dakari, go ahead. Yes, sir. So I actually thought of my first question, then I have another one. But my first one was regarding the Supreme Court and if there was like a max or a min on how many justices there could be. But you just kind of explained that. Um, and then the next question is, what is the difference between an appeals court and a trial court? Okay. Uh, the trial court is the one you go to initially to launch the suit. And that's where you, uh, you know, if there's a jury, that's where the jury's impaneled uh, and the verdict is rendered. And then a judgment is made in the case by the trial judge. Uh, if you don't like what the judgment is that was entered, uh, you can go to the appellate court. The problem with that is that uh, uh, appellate courts don't sit as renewed finders of fact because they didn't hear the witnesses. Uh, they didn't, you know, there's, 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 there, there's no jury there. Uh, so if you're trying to say, well, I'm factually innocent, for example, or 
uh, no, the plaintiff shouldn't have won this because I really didn't run him over. Uh, good luck with that. The, uh, if that's your argument, the court, of, uh, the court of Appeals will uphold what happened in the trial court where the record is created, where the witnesses appeared, if there's basically any evidence to support the judgment of the court. So all you can do on an appeal is to challenge the law, say that the law was incorrectly uh, applied, that the judge gave incorrect legal instructions to the jury, that uh, the legal instructions incorrectly defined the uh, tort at issue, let's say the wrong at issue or the crime at issue, uh, or claim that there were constitutional violations that affected the trial, right? that they, the judge incorrectly admitted this evidence that was illegally seized. Uh, those kinds of things you can raise before the Court of Appeal. So that brings us back full circle for actresses like me who have never studied law and don't know how any of this works, but I'm willing to be stupid so that we can all understand together. That's why a modern day circuit court's different than the circuit court of horses, where are they, the Supreme Court were on their horses because that circuit from the Supreme Court, they were doing a trial, but today the circuit court is an appellate court. In the federal system, correct. That's exactly right. So I get it now. Yeah. I know, I get it. Okay. Circuit court is just a name. You have to look at what it actually does. But I mean, district circuit and then Supreme Court is what you were saying. That's how it would go. That's how it is today. So I never knew, and I'm sorry, I guess I'll just admit I'm stupid or don't know. I'm not stupid. I just don't, I don't have the information. I did not know that an appeals court, and you know, most of us wouldn't if we haven't studied law or haven't had to experience this or haven't been on the hill or been in politics. I didn't know that in appeals court, you didn't have a trial again. Oh. I didn't know that. Well, I, I found no that idea. out today when we were shooting. And it's more, uh, uh, let, me, let me interject something here. When you get to the Supreme Court for review, it gets even more restrictive because the Supreme Court says, we're not a court of error. We're not here to correct mere legal errors. So when we choose cases, we're not choosing them because, hey, some lower court simply made an error. We are a court of law. We choose cases that have a significant legal impact or where there's an important point of law where the circuits are split on the issue and we need to resolve that circuit split. So if you're trying to get Supreme Court review, the best arguments are there's a split in the circuit or that this creates a very substantial constitutional question. The third one, of course, is it was decided by the Ninth Circuit, so therefore it's absolutely wrong. But that's, uh, we, we don't actually write that into the petitions. That's an old Ninth uh, Circuit joke. I we, yeah, no. Hey, we have three whopping minutes. So I'm just so glad I finally understood that. Aren't you proud of me, Professor Nippert? I finally understood it because I know that was a <laughs> but you know, hey, you don't know. People throw these words around, and I'm hoping there are people listening today who didn't know that appeals court didn't actually have a trial. I didn't know that. Maybe there's some people today that didn't know that. So now I understand. Okay, Kathy Dakari, anybody have a final question? We have, uh, you know, 2.5 minutes. Well, I'd like to put a plug in for one of our past 90 day studies, which are landmark Supreme Court justice, Supreme Court decisions and the justices who made them. And you can go on our website if you're interested in specific Supreme Court cases, because we explore some fascinating ones. But one of the most important, Professor Niprath, I think if we could just maybe wrap on this would be if you could just give us a little bit of an explanation of the significance of Marbury versus Madison, because it seems to me that that that, that case kind of began the the concept of judicial review that was not necessarily as robust in the Constitution. Um, so I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but if you might just want to say a little bit about that. Okay, so you asked me to condense my two-hour lecture in my class, which I'm doing now in these classes, <laughs> uh, to two minutes. Uh, okay, uh, Marbury versus Madison uh, in, in the sort of popular mind, uh, to the extent people think about it, is known for Marshall saying, we can declare an act of Congress unconstitutional. I would beg to differ. There were several cases where the Supreme Court 
already said that before Marbury versus Madison in the 1790s. They in fact declared an act of Congress unconstitutional in 1794 in US versus Yale taught. Uh, the, uh, the idea that courts could declare acts of legislation unconstitutional was rooted in state constitutional doctrine going back to the 1780s. Hamilton and, and uh, Judge Robert Yates in the New York Convention had a colloquy, a, a, a debate over that very issue that they, they both agreed the courts would do that. Yates didn't like it, Hamilton did in Federalist 78, but they both agreed that the courts would be doing this. The novelty, the novelty, what had never been done before in Marbury versus Madison actually is the first part of the opinion where, Mar uh, where Marshall keeps suggesting that the court can order the president and executive officials to do things, right? It's one thing to say, if Congress passes a law that says, you, guys, you have to do something in the court, you have to do something. And the court says, we think that's unconstitutional, so we're not gonna do it. It's quite another for the court to say, oh, and we can tell you what to do. And the first part of the opinion that, that, that suggests the courts can issue writs against the pre, even the president, that was what was controversial. And that's what the Jeffersonians and Jefferson were furious about. Not the part that they declared an act of Congress unconstitutional. That had been done before. That had been talked a lot about. Uh, on that part, the only thing that Marshall did was he wrote a very thorough opinion, much of which was cribbed from Federalist 78. So, uh, Yes, uh, Marbury in the popular mind may not be exactly the importance that the Jeffersonians attached to Marbury at the time. Fascinating, thank you very much. Yeah, could it have been a little bit of the cousins uh, going at each other because Marshall and Jefferson were cousins and he's like, you know, I can tell you, you might think you're president, but I can tell you what to do. Right. Uh, there's, some of the, there's some of that, but interesting, in every case where there's a dispute between Marshall and Jefferson, Marshall eventually pulled his punches and never ordered Jefferson to do anything, and never actually held against Jefferson in any, any, any case. Uh, yes, they were cousins, but so were a lot of these other folks, uh, Chief Judge Roan, Monroe. Uh, it seemed like in Virginia, a lot of folks were cousins. <laughs> so, in other words, he, uh, Marshall laid the groundwork, but he never actually called Jefferson to the conference. Exactly. He never actually forced the, any yeah. issue between himself and Jefferson. Yeah. And that's why Marbury and Madison is pretty famous because it's just sort of subtly, you know, creates a wave, doesn't it? Without... Yeah. It's a fascinating case. Well, this, yeah, it really is. I, I actually wrote a, I wrote a book on that. I might not have understood that an appellate court didn't have a trial, but I, I did read a book on yeah. Marbury versus Madison. Yeah, but that's why I spent two hours in class on it. Yeah. So. I know, I would love to be sitting there listening to that. So, well, thank you, Professor Nifrith. You're, you're just so special to us and, and uh, inordinately brilliant. And we're lucky to have you as a fellow for Constituting America. And you helped Juliet with her book, Our Constitution Rocks. And you've just been a true, tried and true friend. So thank you for, for being with us today. We just appreciate you so, so very much for all your essays. And everyone, as Kathy said, please check out our 90-day study. Um, we've had many studies at Constitution America, and Professor Nipreth has written many, many wonderful essays. So thank you, Professor Nipreth. Thank you for having me. It's always my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>